Hello and welcome to Broomfield United Methodist Church. My name is Andrew Sieber. I'm Audra Sieber. And welcome to today's church service. Uh, we have a lot of ways to connect with each other on social media, our website, and even by saying hello in the comment section of, section of Facebook or YouTube. So feel free to interact with each other there. Who are we gathered together today? We are the people of Broomfield United Methodist Church. Who does God call us to be? We are called to celebrate the image of Jesus in everyone. How do we celebrate the image of Jesus in each other? By loving all people as Jesus loves us. And how do we love like Jesus? With no strings attached. Now let us worship in that love and spirit. Ooh.
As we prepare to pray, I invite you to join us for our weekly prayer connection, Sundays at 11 a.m. by Zoom. You can follow the link provided, and we invite you to join us for a time of lifting up one another in prayer, giving thanks to God for all our blessings, and to pray for our church, our community, our state, and our nation. This week, I ask you to pray for our students and teachers and parents at Cole Elementary School, the school which is just a couple of blocks west of the church facility. We have a long-standing relationship with Cole, and we invite you to lift up this important learning community. Let's pray. Risen Lord, we thank you for all the ordinary joys of life. Coffee on our table in the morning, the shouts of children in the parks, a familiar song on the radio, a friendly tree, an owl cooing in her nest, spring blossoms and flowers starting to burst. May simple things speak to us of your mercy and tell us that life can be good you have invited us to taste and see that you are good, and we want to live in this assurance. Help us to trust in your mercy and to give thanks as you watch over us. As we prepare to celebrate the Lord's Supper, we think of all the meals you shared with your disciples, bread, wine, and fish, debates, laughter, and your wisdom, Jesus. As you broke bread with them at the table, you shared their joys, taught them your ways, empowered them to serve, and prepared them for the future. As we commune with you today, help us to do so with gratitude for the same gifts that you still share with us. We give thanks because you lived our life on earth, you understand our griefs, our struggles, our needs, our hopes, and our dreams. Hear our prayers today for comfort, for healing, for guidance, for provision. Hear our prayers as well for those who are struggling with life's challenges. When we walk, help us to remember those who don't have the strength to walk. When we feel on the outside of conversations, Help us to see the people around us who are overlooked. When we feast on good food, help us to be generous to those who are hungry. When we go to work, help us to remember all who are still searching for work. And when we are treated unfairly, help us, Lord, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you. Help us to notice all the good gifts you share with us and to pay attention to the people you place in our lives. Help us to listen to our neighbors, our loved ones, and our friends, but most of all, to listen to your voice, the Good Shepherd. We praise you for watching over us so faithfully, for forgiving our failings, for giving us new life, in you we have abundant grace. In you we have all we need. So we lift our prayers in your precious name as we pray the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Some people think you're distant, just some words on a page. But you're nothing more than fables handed down along the way. But I've seen you part the waters where no one else could pull me from the deep. That's who you are to me. Some people think I just live in cathedrals made of stone. But I know you live inside my heart, and I know that it's your home. And I've seen you in the sunset in the eyes of a stranger on the street. That's who you are to me. You're amazing, faithful, love's open door. When I'm empty, you fill me. Hunger for more of your mercy, your goodness. Lord, you're the air that I breathe. It's who you are to me. Who you are to me. Sometimes I have my doubts, I'm sure that everybody does. Now I wonder when I stumble, am I still worthy of your love? But I know when I get stronger, when I'm talking to you down on my knees. You're everything I need, you're amazing. In the past, when I've heard that song, I've used it as an opportunity to ask myself, who is God to me? And I believe that's an important question to ask, not just in the, in the big moments of life, but in the everyday moments as well. Who is God to me? Well, friends, who is God to you? I imagine that was a question that was on the disciples' hearts after the resurrection. In their three-year journey with Jesus, the answer to that question had changed over time. Jesus was first Messiah, or I'm sorry, first Rabbi, then Messiah, then God, as Thomas so confidently proclaimed in our Bible story last week. But regardless of the titles, Jesus had become their all in all. He had become their very breath. It was through him that they had found their purpose. They had found life's direction. And while Mary had encountered Jesus at the tomb and Jesus had revealed himself to a couple of disciples on a dusty road and had also twice appeared to a group of them behind the closed doors of a house, I'm sure it still felt like the wind had been taken out of their sails. I'm sure it still felt as if they were having trouble catching their breath again. 
I mean, yes, it was a celebration that Jesus was alive. Yes, their hearts leapt with joy knowing that death did not have the final say. Yes, it was amazing that Jesus kept showing up in the most unexpected places. But it just wasn't the same anymore. It wasn't like it, you know, once was. Things were different. They had never done it this way before. Now what? Well, let's see how the disciples respond. We see their response to another appearance in John chapter 21, verses 1 through 14, where it says, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said, well, we'll go with you. And they went out and they got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach. But the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, well, cast the net to the right side of the boat and there you'll find some. And so they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes for he was naked and he jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish for they were not far from land, only about a hundred yards off. And when they had gone ashore, they saw a, a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and he hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them. And he did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Amen. I love the ordinariness, if that's a word. I love the ordinariness of this story. It's a, it's a story that I can kind of put myself into, you know? I mean, I've been fishing before, although I'm not very good at it. I've had a total stranger give me pointers as to where the fish are biting, and while I might not have caught 153 fish, I appreciated the fact that another person had interest in in me having a good fishing experience. I've had breakfast around a campfire, although the smell of frying bacon instead of fish, that's a lot more to my liking. There's something simple, something refreshing about this story about the manner by which Jesus appears to his disciples again. And actually, when you think about the story of Jesus, Jesus' whole story, he seems to make a habit of making appearances into the everyday, ordinary spaces of our lives. Think about it. When Jesus is born, a feed trough is used as his cradle. He grows up in the obscurity of a carpenter shop in the backwater town of Nazareth. It's like living in Tempest, Colorado. It actually exists. I encourage you to look it up. During his ministry, he is an itinerant preacher, and he relies on others' hospitality for a place to lay his head at night. He even uses ordinary things. He uses dirt and spit to restore someone's sight. He uses five fish and two loaves of bread to feed 5,000 people. It was upon two pieces of wood that he took his last breath. And now here he is, showing up on a beach, and he's organized a barbecue. You can't get more ordinary than that. 
But understandably, it took the disciples a bit to kind of figure out what was going on. At first, they didn't recognize that it was Jesus. And we have to cut them some slack here. I mean, it was daybreak. Jesus was on the shore some 100 yards away. And they were probably tired from fishing all night. They were probably frustrated that they were not able to secure a catch. I mean, remember, just three years earlier, they had walked away from their jobs as fishermen. And and maybe some of them were beginning to wonder if if maybe they'd lost their touch a bit. Because there's nothing worse for a for professional fishermen to be out all night long and not come home with fish. And in the dark hours of that morning, with the deep feelings of emptiness and grief pressing in on them, I imagine the wind must have seemed colder, maybe even the wet nets heavier than usual. Sometimes in the ordinariness and routine of our daily lives, it can feel heavy and empty like that, can't it? We can feel trapped, locked in by the ordinary things so that life becomes dark, maybe uninteresting. We feel bored, depressed. We try hard to make it work, to to make things better, but we keep coming up empty. There's just no fish. And it's into this space that Jesus comes, just as he did for his disciples. Now, the disciples still do not know that it's Jesus when Jesus says, children, you have no fish, have you? And I would think that Jesus calling them children would have either, one, caused them to recognize it was Jesus, or two, ignore the stranger altogether as he gave advice along the shoreline. But regardless... The disciples do what he says. And maybe they saw it as an opportunity to silence this stranger, or maybe they thought he caught sight of a school of fish. We don't really know. But what we do know is that they cast their nets. And the result is astounding. But notice here. It isn't the voice of Jesus or the appearance of Jesus or the command of Jesus that gets their attention. It was the full net. That's when the beloved disciple declared to Peter that the stranger was no stranger at all. It was Jesus and he noticed it when he saw the net full of fish. Ordinary fish. What makes you notice God's activity in your life? In what ways does Jesus reveal himself to you? And when you recognize him, how do you respond? I love how Peter responds. He he doesn't wait for the group to row back to shore. He, He jumps out of the boat. He makes a mad dash to Jesus. And it's a wonderful image. And I begin to wonder what was going through his mind. And was he running to apologize for denying Jesus three times? Was he eager to get back to work? And work that was different than fishing. Was he hoping that Jesus was finally going to get back to being the Messiah that he had longed for? Was was he simply excited to spend yet another moment with his beloved teacher? How would any of us respond to the opportunity to run into the arms of a loved one who has died? or a beloved friend or family member we haven't seen or been able to touch in a long time because of the pandemic, I can certainly understand Peter's desperation to run to Jesus. And after all, they were all ashore. After they were all ashore, Jesus then made them some breakfast. And as they sat around that campfire, he didn't shame them. He didn't say, I told you so. He didn't question them. Similar to a time only a few weeks before, he offered them something to eat, bread and fish. He was there to nourish his tired friends. Friends, I don't know about you, but this pandemic has made me tired. Tired of Zoom meetings, tired of wearing a mask, tired of the uncertainty, Tired of not being able to worship together or fellowship with one another. Tired of being tired. And I'm sure I'm not alone. But whatever state you find yourself in, 
Jesus wants to meet you there in that ordinary moment of your day to minister to your heart, to satisfy you, to feed your soul once again. There's a Christian practice that can help us with this, and it's called the examine of consciousness. And it's actually quite simple. All you have to do is take a few minutes at the end of every day to review the events of that day. And then as you review them, asking God to show you evidence of the divine presence that maybe you'd missed. Now, you might prefer to do this in the morning as you look back on the previous 24 hours. It doesn't matter. It's just taking that time to reflect. And as you reflect on every aspect of the day, waking, showering and dressing, eating, commuting, Zoom meetings, relating with others, difficulties and challenges with work, moments of pleasure and pain, consolation, desolation, decision-making, interacting with the news and needs of the world, going back home, or going from the office back to the family room, wherever it is, the evening spent with friends or family, working late, crawling into bed. You can ask God, where were you present in the ordinary of my day, turning the mundane into the sacred? Reveal yourself to me, God. Help me to see you. Friends, the heart of the Christian experience is having faith that God will meet you there and reveal God's self to you. The miracle of the gospel is that the Word became flesh and has dwelt among us. And when our lives seem mundane, when our lives seem far from extraordinary, we need to hold on to the miracle of faith and have eyes to see God in the everydayness of life. Our everyday lives, with all their joys and celebrations, pains and tears, they become transformed by the presence of God with us. Can you look at your life and see the presence of the divine? Can you face the demands of life and find within them echoes of God? Can you endure all things, love all things, and see the pattern of the footprints of God leading you into a deeper experience of His grace? Because God takes the ordinary and everyday things and transforms them by His presence. And that's why, friends, it's so important for us to participate in the sacred meal. Just like that one on the beach, that that meal when we break bread with the risen Jesus, when we drink again from the cup that he offers. The bread and cup are a commitment to us that Jesus loves us, cares for us, never abandons us. And not only that, but when we participate in this holy meal, we do it as one church, one body, united in the mystery that is set before us. And we are reminded that all are invited to this table to receive the fullness of God's life and grace as found in something as common as bread and as ordinary as juice. Can you see God at this table? Can you hear Jesus when he gathered with his disciples in the upper room and taking bread? He said, this is my body broken for you. Take Eat, do it in remembrance of me. And what are you feeling when you hear Jesus say after lifting the cup, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. And as you drink it, know of my love, know of my mercy, and do it in remembrance of me. We eat the bread and we drink the cup in an ordinary way. And we give over to God our everyday lives, all our joys and sorrows, pleasures and pains. And we ask God to become word in our flesh. And through that act, we receive God into the very depths of our being, opening our eyes, ears and hearts to seeing Jesus. Will you pray with me? 
O oh God, who knows our every need and meets us exactly where we are, may God your peace sustain us. May your love invigorate us. May your meal nourish us. May your presence be made real to us today and every day to come. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, we pray. Amen. Friends, it is take the bread, see abundant life within it, and receive it. And then take the cup, see the presence of grace, and let it nourish you. Amen. Spirit divine, come, open our eyes to see God at work everywhere. This summer, we have a message series called Questions, and we need to hear your questions about life, faith, God, Jesus, the Bible, whatever it is. No question is off limits. We want to hear from you. So go to the link you see on your screen. The link will also be in the, in the description on the YouTube video. We'll put, post it in the comments on Facebook. We want to hear from you. Your responses are anonymous. Your name won't be attached. We won't know who's asking the question, but uh, there will be a chance for you to tell us kind of how old you are. It'll be cool to hear some questions from kids too. We want to respond because no question is too big or too scary for God. Also coming up is in-person worship, and we're excited to be together. Right now on our predictometer, we're in yellow, hopeful. But the numbers have been going kind of the wrong way. So keep an eye on that predictometer, uh, which is kind of a fun way we've been talking about our red, yellow, and green system for telling you whether or not we'll be in person. You are so generous. You give in so many ways. Thank you for the ways that you give. You can make a gift online. You can send a check. You can do it like I do it and make a recurring gift. Just every month it comes out of my bank account. I don't have to think about it, but I do get to pray when I see that statement come in and thank God for the ways that I'm so blessed and that I can give. So this week, may you see Jesus in the ordinary, in ordinary things like meals, like dogs, like going out to pick up the mail, 
May you go and see Jesus everywhere. Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like me.